Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SGS 2019 Full Year Results Conference Call and Live Webcast. I am Alice, the Course Call Operator. I would like to remind you that all participants will be in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can register for questions at any time by pressing star and 1 on your telephone. In the interest of time, come and limit yourself to two questions. Webcast viewers may submit their questions in writing by the relative field. For operator assistance, please press star and zero. The conference must not be recorded for publication or broadcast. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Toby Riggs, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations at SGS Auditorium in Geneva. He will now be joined into the conference room. Dominic, if you'd like to start the presentation. No, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and welcome again to the presentation of our full year 2019 results. Um, as usual, I will start with the highlight of our full year performances, then I will hand it over to Dominic to give you a more detailed walkthrough of the financial results, and then I will come back to give you an outlook and guidance for 2020. Um, let me start on that uh, slide. Uh, total revenue grew by, grew by 1.2% of constant currency, while the organic growth was 2.6%. Our adjusted operating income stands at 1 billion and 63 million francs, a 4.6% increase compared to 2018. Profit for the period stands at 702 million Swiss francs, an increase of 1.7% compared to last year, and the free cash flow from operation amounts to 870 francs compared to 70, 796 francs in 2018. Our ROIC has improved to 25.5% for the last 12 months. And the board of directors is proposing a dividend of 80 francs per share, an increase of, from 78 francs in 2018. Uh, this slide shows a little bit uh, the, the KPIs that we have uh, established in terms of uh, growth stability profile and the long-term value creation of our portfolio for our shareholders. We expect uh, to be able to maintain or improve this performance going forward, but just to give you an indication on what we've done over the last few years. During 2019, we remain disciplined and focused on our capital allocation, deploying it in line with our long-term objective. So during the year, we made 11 acquisitions in six business lines in order to strengthen our portfolio. The largest of those acquisitions is main point uh, in the U.S., and together with the Linksys, which was the first acquisition we made in 2016, enhanced our capability and our strength in the operational consulting area and add additional value to our customers, not just the CBE customers, but across the board of our customer base. Four acquisitions were made in EHS. Forians increased expertise in the fire consulting. 
uh, our global laboratory network has been strengthened with the addition of PTWLN in Indonesia and forensic analytic laboratories in the U.S. And DMW environmental safety support our growth in the health and safety sectors. And this one is based in the, US, uh, in the U.K. I'll talk about that. And after the full year closure, we also announced an additional acquisition in the area of uh, consumer retail services in the U.S. It's uh, Thomas J. Stevenson's. Stevens, sorry, is a company which is specialized in clinical research in the safety and efficacy of cosmetic and uh, personal health care products. So combined with HRL, that is an acquisition made a couple of years ago, uh, this will enhance our capabilities and the competence and the service offering in the U.S. market. So this is a quite good addition to our expansion to the U.S. market. During the 2019 exercise, we also made four disposals. So we mentioned earlier to the DC about petroleum services corporations, which is a larger one. But we also made the disposal to the end of the, uh, last year with the vehicle inspection in the U.S. as well. And we also disposed of our P2 activities in the Netherlands. And the ones that we have not highlighted too much, it was a small legacy licenses activities that we had in, the, in Italy that we disposed of during the first half of the year, I believe, but it's also a rather small unit and we have not uh, flagged this one. Uh, if, you look, if you take the full uh, disposal together, we are more or less around the 20 50 million francs of revenue, and this is in line from the numbers I have highlighted during the 2018 university stage in terms of disposal uh, strategy. So, but besides acquisition and disposal, the Ashes Group is continuing to invest in new sectors to position ourselves for long-term evolutions. Uh, a couple of examples just to highlight um, our cyber laboratories strategy. Well, I mentioned that already in the half years. This is a strong development on the progress in terms of expansion in Europe and in the, in the U.S. is according to our plan. A second development in terms of uh, new business is our cyber, uh, semiconductor industry. We have the new strategy in terms of uh, semiconductor industry, especially in China. Some of you that has been with us during the industry day of 2019 last year in Taipei has shown some of the activities that were performing there, and we're trying to expand these kind of similar activities in the Chinese market, which is a quite fast-growing segment. Uh, those two developments, cybersecurity and semiconductor, in terms of connectivity, interoperability, cybersecurity, and data quality. So all that is really in terms of uh, development for the long-term strategy of the SS Group. On that, I'm going to hand over to Dominic to go through the financial reviews, and I'll come back with an outlook for each of the businessmen. Thank you, Frankie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will start with the overview of the financial highlights for 2019. Frank already mentioned operating highlights in his introduction with revenues of 6.6 .6 billion Swiss franc and adjusted operating income of 1 billion 63 million. Revenues for the group in constant currency increased by 1.2 percent, driven by the organic growth in the majority of our segments of 2.6 percent, partly offset by the net effect of acquisitions and disposals. The adjusted operating income increased by 4.6 percent in constant currency to 1 billion 63 million, leading to a margin increase of 50 basis points to 16.1 percent in 2019. The strong increase in the operating income of 18 percent in constant currency is a result of the 259 million Swiss franc gain of the disposal of PSC, net of transaction cost in the U.S., partly compensated by provisions for indirect taxes considered in the first half 2019, a goodwill impairment of 21 million considered in the first half of 2019, the structuring cost of 89 million, while the vast majority is related to the structural cost optimization program executed in the second half of 2019, and impairment of fixed and intangible assets of 24 million considered in the second half of 2019. While the operating profit in 2018, so the year before, was negatively impacted by 47 million in relation to the overstatement of revenues in Brazil. The effective tax rate 
increased from 24% in the prior year to 31% in 2019. The increase in the tax rate is due to valuation allowance on DTAs as disclosed in the first half of 2019. Subsequently, net profit after minority interest increased by 2.6% to 660 million cis franc in fiscal year 2019. We posted a moderate organic growth of 2.6%, while acquisitions added 1.1%, and the disposals had a negative impact of 2.5%, leading to constant currency growth rate of 1.2%. The negative currency impact of 2.8% was due to the strengthening of the CIS rank against all major currencies, with the exception of the US dollar. Moving on to the revenue growth by business. Acre Food and Life achieved solid organic growth of 3.8%. Growth in trade and logistics was good. In food, solid and life delivered moderate growth. Our growth in minerals decelerated as expected throughout the year, leading to a solid organic revenue growth rate of 3.7%. The growth was primarily driven by the trade and geochem business while metallurgy and blend operations declined as a result of delayed projects in a softer market. Organic growth in oil, gas, and chemicals was 2.9%. Trade was broadly stable despite a more competitive environment and pricing pressure in several jurisdictions. Upstream achieved strong double-digit growth, and strong growth was also achieved in oil conditioning monitoring, while the non-inspection-related testing services was stable. Consumer and retail continues to grow strongly, delivering an organic growth of 5.4%. The strongest growth driver was the electrical and electronics business. Growth in soft lines was solid, benefiting from new customers and strong performance of new sourcing countries, including Vietnam, Turkey, Indonesia, and Cambodia, while China remained stable. Hardline achieved strong growth, benefiting from increased volume of activity with e-retailers and other e-platforms. CBE delivered double-digit growth of 13.2% driven by acquisitions. The organic growth of 1.5% in fiscal year 2019 reflects the fact that we returned to good growth in the later part of the year after the transition period. After a strong first half in industrial, organic revenues in the second half 2019 declined by 2%, leading to moderate organic growth of 2.3% in our industrial business. The slowdown in the second half reflects the reduction of exposure to value-destroying businesses, leading subsequently to a very strong margin and profit increase. Good organic growth of 4.6% was achieved in environment, health, and safety, driven by strong growth in field and monitoring services, as well as health and safety services, while growth in the laboratory services was solid. Organic revenue and transportation declined by 3.7%, driven by weaker demand in field services, mainly related to the supply chain certification as suppliers completed their certification to the new standard. Regulated services were impacted by reduced volumes on some programs, the completion of a contract, and increased competition in Spain. Revenues in GIS declined organically by 4.8%, reflecting an unexpected change in government policies on import duties in Ghana, as well as lengthy implementation and enforcement of recently signed government contracts, particularly in the e-waste monitoring solution, Renovo. From a regional point of view, organic growth in Europe, Africa, and Middle East was modest with 1.6%. Eastern Europe and Middle East delivered strong high single-digit growth. Growth in North Central Europe was solid, while growth in Africa was held back by the weakness in our GIS and transportation business. Americas posted organic revenue growth of 2.3%, driven by strong growth in South Central America, and here in particular in Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. 
while growth in North America was broadly stable. The good organic growth in Asia-Pacific of 4.4% continues to be driven by strong growth in China, Korea, and Vietnam, while growth in Australia was solid and it was moderate in Taiwan and Japan. Hong Kong and Thailand declined slightly. The development of the headcount is well controlled and contributes strongly to a higher productivity level. At the end of December 2019 versus December 2018, FTEs decreased 4.8%, driven by organic additions of 1.4% and the impact from acquisitions of 0.5% more than offset by the reduction related to the cost optimization program of 2.3%. The disposals had an impact of minus 4.4%. From a regional point of view, all regions improved their productivity. The highest productivity increase was achieved in the America segment, which is a function of the structural cost optimization program achieved, but also the impact of the disposal of PSC. The trusted operating income increased at constant currency by 4.6%, which reflects the organic increase of 4.8%, as the impact of acquisitions and disposals almost offset each other. Currency had an adverse impact of 3.4%, leading to an increase of 1.2% in actual rate in the period under review. The trusted operating margin agri-food and life declined by 20 basis points to 16% on a constant currency basis, impacted by less favorable geographic mix for agri-food and continued investments to increase capacity and capabilities in the laboratory network. Margins in minerals increased strongly by 19 basis points to 17% on a constant currency basis, driven through efficiency benefits and the discipline pricing structure. Oil, gas, and chemicals improved margins also very strongly by 180 basis points in constant currency. The increase is a function of the implemented cost control measures, strong improvement in the upstream business, and a significant shift in business mix following the disposal of PTO business in the U.S. and the Netherlands. Our most profitable segment, CIS, saw the margin decline of 10 basis points to 25.7%, on a constant currency basis. Good margin increases in, in electronic and electronics were offset by strategic investments in new technology and in cyber security. Despite the difficult post-ISO transition market conditions, the adjusted operating income margin in CBE increased by 40 basis points to 20.4% on a constant currency basis, driven by efficiency gains and the diversification into technical consultancy. The significant margin increase of 300 basis points to 12% in constant currency in the industrial business is a result of active portfolio management and structural and structural cost optimization across regions and various management layers. Adjusted operating income margin EHS increased by 150 basis points to 12.4% on a constant currency basis, driven by the operation leverage as well as the benefits resulting from the restructuring of our U.S. operations. The margin decline in transportation business is due to the loss of higher margin contract in the regulated and the certification segment. The significant margin decline in the GIS business is primarily related to, substan to substantial collection delays, namely in Haiti and Ghana. Moving on to the balance sheet, the balance sheet per December 2019 compared to the balance sheet per end of 18 considers the change in relation to IFR 16, lease accounting standard, and IFRIC 23, which addresses the interpretation of uncertainty over income taxes. Both accounting standards are effective as of January 1, 2019. The increase in PP&E of 568 million is explained by the recognition of the right of use assets, which amounted to 611 million as of December 31st, given the introduction of IFS 16. Out of the lease liabilities of 644 million, 
at the end of December 2019, 154 million are considered as grants, while the remaining amount is considered as long-term lease liability. Subsequent to the introduction of April 23, 40 million was recognized in current tax liabilities as adjustment in the opening equity. The increase in goodwill is primarily due to the consolidation of the balance sheet of main point, unbuilt revenues, work in progress, as well as trade receivables were reduced compared to the prior year, supporting the strong development of networking capital. The net debt position for fiscal year 2019 stands at 1.4 billion, considering IFRS 16 or 764 million, excluding IFRS 16 compared to 772 million in the prior year. The operating cash flow increased from 1 billion 74 million last year to 1 billion 149 million this year. However, given the introduction of IFRS 16, the payment of lease liabilities and its interest of 195 million is now shown in the financing activities. The outflow for working capital was with 3 million minor, while we had in the prior year an inflow of 95 million. Taxes paid increased from 265 million in the prior year to 300 Six million. Net investment in fixed assets were with, 700, uh, excuse me, were with 279 million on a similar level as last year. Cash considerations for acquisitions increased to 169 million, while we had at the same time a strong inflow from disposals of 333 million. We paid dividends of 589 million in the first half 2019 and paid back the Swiss franc bond, which was due in the first half 19, for a consideration of 375 million. The management of networking capital continues to be a very strong feature of SGS. After strongly improving the oper operational networking capital in the prior year to 0.6% of revenues, we continue to further improve the networking capital as percentage of revenues to 0.3% which is primarily related by strong management of unbuilt revenues, work in progress, as well as the trade receiver position. CapEx for 2019 was at 4.4% on a similar level like last year. For 2020, we expect an acceleration towards the higher 4% area supporting our growth initiatives. While our margin expansion in the first half 2019 was with 20 basis points held back by bad debt provisions, we achieved in the second half 2019 a strong margin uplift of 90 basis points despite a deceleration of organic revenue growth. The improvement in the second half of 2019 is primarily related to the structural cost optimization program and the disposal of the PSC business. While the positive impact of IFRS 16 was offset by bad debt provisions, for which we expect collection to improve in the year 2020. We are pleased to confirm that the cost optimization program aiming at simplifying the business by eliminating duplications and reducing layers within our organization was fully executed at the end. The incurred cost for the program stand at 73 million, pretty in line with the estimate provided of 75 million. We expect analyzed recurring savings of above 90 million, out of which 15 million are already achieved in the second half 2019. The full benefit of the program will be realized in the course of the first quarter. The implemented EVA recovery plans started to contribute positively to our recent performance benefiting from considered closures, but also underlying improvements within the businesses in scope. In respect of active portfolio management, we recently strengthened our portfolio with, with the acquisition of Stevens in the U.S., in the, especially in the cosmetic segment. The disposal of the pre-owned vehicle inspection operations in the U.S. will strengthen our return profile, especially in the U.S. And finally, we expect a solid cash inflow from the disposal of the non-core activity related to pest control in the first quarter 2020. 2020. In summary, our financial performance for 2019 looks as follows. We achieved an organic growth of 2.6%, 
our adjusted operating income increased by 4.6% in constant currency, resulting in a margin increase of 50 basis points to 16.1%. The profit for the period increased by 1.7% to 702 million, and the board is proposing a dividend of 80 bis franc per share. Before I hand back to Frankie, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all our colleagues around the world for their commitment, their dedication, and their hard work to achieve the set of results which we present today. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. So let me walk through you through uh, each of the business lines in terms of outlook for, for 2020. So let me start with uh, agricultural food and life. You know, it's always difficult to predict crop and trading conditions for the agricultural sectors, but uh, for the moment, so what we've seen, we're looking at the similar market condition as in 2019. Testing and auditing activities for food are expected to remain good moving into 2020. Live senses should recover from some short-term contract delay and accelerate back to normal growth level in 2020. So on the overall for AFL, I'm looking at an acceleration of growth in 2020. Minerals. The mineral sector was under pressure moving into the second half of 2019. Am I expecting the situation to be similar moving into 2020? Exploration is expected to be relatively subdued in 2020, but our geo chem on celebratory strategy should provide good stability and predictable volume, and the same is expected from our trade service portfolio. So overall for minerals, I'm looking at a slightly lower growth in 2020 than 2019, considering the overall market situation. For all gas and chemicals, OGC overall market condition remains soft. However, the trade activities remain stable in H2. Conditions should be similar within 2020. Upstream activities should provide some good upside momentum with new contracts expected in Africa and Middle East. Overall, for OGC, I'm expecting an underlying growth level similar to 2019 for excluding PSC. So a good growth indicator is a uh, second half of 2019 for you two to consider. Consumer and retail. Well, again, assuming that the tension between the U.S. and China stays at the current level, I'm expecting the performance of CLS in 2020 to be similar to 2019. The portfolio mix may change slightly with faster growth in cosmetic and personal care and 5G testing and mixed growth in the more traditional softline and hardline sectors. CBE, Certification Business Enhancement. Uh, for CBE, the effect of uh, the ISO 2015 transition should be fully behind us moving into 2020. The pipeline for our operational consulting activity is very strong. So overall, I'm expecting a strong growth for CB in 2020. Industrial. As Dominic just mentioned now, the focus of industrial in 2019 was to rebuild its portfolio and a focus on improving profitability. Looking at the strong margin performances in H2, I think we have achieved this goal. So the level of margin is sustainable and will increase further. Considering our strategic decision to discontinue several maintenance contracts in South, Africa, South America, the closure of our pipeline and non destructive activities in the U.S., and also the additional discontinuation of several low-profit contracts in Europe during the second half of 2019, I'm expecting the growth of industrial to be negatively impacted until Q3 2020. Along with our health and safety, um, EHS has an overall strong year in 2019, and market conditions are not expected to change significantly in 2020. Together with the additional competence acquired through the four acquisitions of 2019, I'm expecting a strong 2020 for EHS, similar to the level that we have seen in 2019. GIS, Government Institutional Services. Uh, as Dominic mentioned as well, in these sections, we have faced some Long delay in implementation of several projects, especially, especially related to Renovo, the e-waste programs in Africa. The result of H2 was certainly disappointing. Moving into 2020, we have better visibility on startup of several smaller new contracts, but remain cautious 
with the implementation of some of the larger ones that did not happen in 2019. So I'm rather cautious for the first half of the year, improving the second half. So overall, I'm looking at the soft full year growth for GIS. Transportation. So the regulated and fuel services is still under pressure. Uh, sorry, on the transition period and ending of contract in the U.S. and more competitive landscape in Europe with changes of market conditions. This should be a drive for the growth in 2020, but should improve throughout the year. The testing activities should see some good growth with additional testing capacity in Germany and India coming on stream. Overall, I'm looking at the broad, broadly flat growth and improvement compared to last year. Just some additional um, remarks about transportation. As part of our strategic business review, I have decided to break down our transportation business unit into four strategic segments and integrate them with all the business lines. The larger regulated business will go on the GIS, while the testing and field activities will be integrated with industrial. Consumer will absorb some of the testing activities related to chemistry and onboard electronics, while CBE will absorb the certificate activities. The purpose of this change is really to optimize our market approach. Uh, for instance, for our regulatory services, our customers being the government, it is natural that we focus one of our business unit, GIS, to deal with this current base and try to optimize our synergy across the different government departments. There is also a geographical synergy between those two businesses. For the remaining of the transportation activities, such as our space, automotive testing, and rail, these will be joined by our industrial services. As we evolve in our strategy, it is clear to me that the conversions between the broader material testing of industrial uh, and the more specific material testing of transportation will, uh, will converge together and there is a logic for optimizing the operational delivery of those activities. So the labs at the operational level has been merged and we will develop the transportation unit on the industrial to do the sales process. Uh, with these changes, uh, we will not be reporting separately transportation starting the first half to, of 2020. Uh, before I go into the outlook uh, guidance for 2019, so just in terms of um, margins. So in terms of margin for all the business lines, considering the optimization plan, the efficiency schemes that we have put in place, like the world-class services, our constant dashboard review, and our optimization of our portfolio, I'm expecting all the business lines to improve their margin in 2020, and I remain very really confident regarding our 17% adjusted open income margin for the end of 2020 exercise. So in terms of guidance, based on what I just mentioned per business line, I'm looking at uh, the solid organic growth, a higher adjusted open income, and a published cash flow for 2020. To conclude, I would like also to thank my colleagues at the Operations Council, the most of them are here, and the entire SS group for achieving this set of solid results. Uh, also, I would like to thank, for, thank all of them for their commitment to uphold our group's sustainability culture. SS has been a pioneer in driving sustainability practices in the tech sector, and our inclusion in the FTSE for Good Indexes, our carbon neutral status, and our leading position in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index a reflection of our dedication to make a difference in this area of sustainability. We believe that our strong financial result and our, commitment, our clear commitment to sustainability and ESG position SJS as a leader in the testing inspection service industry and help to create long-term value for SJS employees, customers, shareholders, and society in general. And to conclude my presentation, so just to remind you on the Outlook 2020, in terms of plan, which is the last year of our 2016-2020 plan, so uh, solid organic growth, mid single digit uh, organic growth. In fact, accelerator m and AY margin at least 17%, strong cash flow conversions, return, strong robust return on invested capital, solid dividend distribution, at least maintaining in line with improvement in adjusted net earnings. Again, we're very really uh, really focused in delivering those 2020 plans, but we're also looking at uh, our next strategic growth in terms of uh, evolutions, and uh, we are looking forward to present this plan uh, with you later on this year. On that, 
think now uh, we'll move on to Q&A. We'll start in the room, and then we'll go to the conference call, and then if there are any questions on the webcast, I'll just check there aren't any at the moment. We, we will read those out too. So who would like to go first in the room? Question star in one. Well, please. Um, just firstly, uh, can you give us a sense of the exit rate in terms of organic growth? Um, if you can break down the second half between the quarters, and what does that imply for first half performance, the organic perspective? And then secondly, on margin, it looks like M&A contributed about 40 bips of margin expansion in the second half of the year. Should we roll that into the first half? And then with cost savings delivering 110 bips, um, are there any offsetting investments that we should be taking into account when trying to work out the margin for this year? Yeah, so basically, um, we're not commenting on, on exit rates, it's more for typical companies like staffing companies. But in, <laughs> but, but, but in, but in general, as, as you know, um, uh, during the second half of the year, the growth rate slowed, slowed a bit down. I mean, this was the reason why we why we guided the growth a bit lower uh, towards uh, the investor days, and then it picked up a little bit again. Right? Obviously, if you think about if you think about um, let's say the 1.7 percent, which we have which we have uh, in the in the second half of the year, it, it's a clear deceleration from the 3.5, and, and a lot of these things are also uh, done on purpose, like in the industrial business. So we, you definitely uh, have to see this re-accelerating throughout throughout next year because uh, second half will be an easier comp in, in, in that respect. Yeah, so growth rate should should accelerate, but much more towards the second half of the year. And also, if you take Frankie's comment about industrial, where we expect definitely the first half still a revenue decline. Yeah, and and also for for GIS um, coming from the more yeah. Minus 4.8% uh, back to growth will take some time. So it's definitely more uh, in that direction. If we look to the margin increase, if you look to the sec in the second half, we had 90 basis points improvement. Um, and uh, if you take this 90 basis points, you can say the 50 million gives you around the 50 basis points. Um, obviously, um, from a runway point of view, we are not with 50 million fully there, but this will happen in, 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 um, in, in Q1, so you have an uplift of 75 million at, at least, which is roughly 110 basis points, and, and this should be pretty equal spread because the program is implemented, so basically as of January, we should have the whole benefits, um, and, and I would say from a margin increase, it should be pretty strong in the first, in the first, in the first half. Um, from the 90 basis points, yeah, around the 50 is structural, 30 basis points is still, let's say, the benefit coming just from the mix of, of selling PSC. So this mix is still happening in the first half, so from this point of view, there should be a strong margin uplift in the first half. Thank you. Any offsets? The cost optimization should really come down to the bottom line. Obviously, we're doing here and there investments, but it's not something where we, where we now have to say we have to accelerate a lot. Yeah? We have other cost measures underlying productivity. SJ has always improved productivity every year, and obviously, um, uh, part of this productivity will be, will be also invested. Yeah? We, we're also looking for more CapEx um, uh, this year than, than last year, but it should not, um, by any means, uh, put at risk 17% plus margin target. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. It's uh, Alex Mees here from JP Morgan. Um, firstly, in consumer, you've called out 5G as being a, an area of uh, positivity for you. I wonder if you can just give some color as to how that accelerates through 2020, if indeed it does accelerate. Um, secondly, on GIS, I wonder if you can comment on the materiality of the, uh, of the issues in, in Haiti and, and Ghana and whether the business has to change its business practices at all to, uh, to respond to issues like this in the future. And thirdly, apologies if I missed it, but I wonder if you provided a reconciliation of the segmental performance in 2019 with transportation pushed into the other sectors. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me just answer the first question about 5G. 
You know what? This is the 19 and 20 are the transition years for the different technology. You hear a lot about 5G on the market, especially on the on the mobile phone sectors. I think this is where the transition is happening. So the 4G technology will still remain technology, but you can see an increase of, uh, I would not call them prototype, but I think we've gone over this period. It's more a mainstream product coming in the next 18 months. It's been tested today. They will be hitting the market in the next uh, 18 months, and we're starting to see an emergence of that. But I think the 5G increase will really come for the use into uh, the broader industrial environment versus the consumer good only. And this is going to come in the next, uh, I would say, two years plus, where this is going to be implemented across the uh, broader spectrum. For the time being, I would say it's really at the early stage. When you look at in terms of investment, we invested to a certain extent in 2019, and we've been having an additional investment in the network for 5G capabilities in 2020. On the TIS performance, if you look to the margin decline last year of a bit more than 10%, you can attribute roughly 70% of this margin decline or can calculate an absolute profit to a change in bad debt provisions, right? So increase in bad debt provisions. Um, the biggest part is for Haiti and Ghana. There are a couple of other contracts as well, but the biggest part is for Haiti and Ghana. And for Haiti, we have put an allowance on the complete receivable. So we put the receivable to zero. Um, we have with both, um, let's say, government Discussions, good discussions. We are confident we receive money, but it will take it will most likely take a bit of bit of time. Um, on the on the contracts in general, if you look to a lot of our contracts, they are much more more and more supplier funded. They are not government funded. Um, if you look, for example, the Cameroon contract, it's very clear that we get our fee based on the flow and not rely that we get paid from the government, but um, IT uh, especially is a legacy contract where this change was so far not, we were not able to yeah, achieve this change. But in general, the model, I would say, was already quite changed in that respect that on all the new contracts that they are much more funded by, let's call it, participant suppliers and by, by governments. But the, the two big ones where the situation is a bit different is, is, is IT and GCNet. Um, regarding transportation, you want to know roughly the split? When, when, or? The, pro, when the pro forma... Numbers will be available effectively for, for the analysts. I, I, that, that'll be in due course, I think, is yeah. not that question. I mean, if you want to know roughly uh, revenue split, I can give it a bit. Yeah. I'm sure that'll help their models, but no. okay. I think they'll look for the numbers. Yeah, we, we can't, let's say we, we, we have now to, to um, put this in the right structure and, and, and you get it well ahead of, of H1 number. Thank you very much. Who would like to go next? Uh, why don't we start why don't we start the front of the Tom's easy, actually. Um, reminder, two questions, and Tom, hold it close to your mouth, please. Thank you for the advice. Um, how to use the microphone. Um, so just on, you mentioned that CapEx may increase, and in I didn't quite decipher all that you said about the leases and what was going into the PPE, but it does look like organically you were flat slightly down again in terms of the movement in PPE, which is like the third, fourth year or so in a row. And part of that is the CapEx optimization. You're only really growing by inflation, it looks like. Maybe there's a bit of volume. But how can you give us some confidence that you can actually commit capital and grow as you're committing that capital and not just on M&A, please? And then on the minerals business, could you maybe just go through the, the uh, you know, potential ups and downs in that outlook for you for minerals? Because it does seem like the production outlook is a little bit less certain than it was, and maybe your business mix has obviously changed a bit in that division, and say so how comfortable can we feel that you, as you said, expect to see margins go up in each division, but the margin would go up, or you get EBIT improvement in minerals, please. First to the CapEx, um, so if, if, I, if I look to it, um, we definitely have, have a lot of focus on, 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 on several key topics like 5G, like semiconductor business but also areas of upstream where we have strong growth, um, where, we, where we definitely spend more capex. And looking to the pipeline and looking what we discussed in the operational council, it, it, should, it should definitely kick in into, into um, this year. Maybe uh, 2019, we were thinking it was coming a bit earlier, and sometimes this project takes some time. 
until until we get until we get all the components. But uh, it's it, it's very clear that the capex will accelerate, and this is primarily related to yeah to a large extent investments in 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 E and E within within CIS. Um, given given the the growth opportunities we are seeing, um, we have a good pipeline of um, of on-site labs for minerals. There it sometimes depends, of course, whether we get we get um, the award from the client. Um, but um, we are very successful in this area, so there we see some some pickup. And our upstream business in oil, gas, chemicals has shown very strong performance throughout um, uh, um, last year with double-digit growth. And there's a good pipeline of customers, so we we do think uh, capex and percentage of revenue will will pick up this year. Higher four percent area. Four and a half to five. So last year we had four point four, more towards higher four percent. So maybe a fifty basis point. Uh, go on. Yeah, the final question. Yeah. Second question from Tom. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in the mineral sectors, uh, so it's difficult for me to give you a whole uh, summary. We say you look at this, for example, the copper explorations uh, investment has increased while the gold investment has decreased because of the price fluctuations. But what, what, is, what is important for us is uh, our strategy for the on-site laboratories is a stabilizing factor. So we have two of the new labs coming on board, uh, which just came on board uh, toward the end of 2019, which add additional volumes for, for 2020, and we have two additionals is uh, supposed to come on board. We signed it's going to come on board in 2020. While we are going to, uh, to see probably an impact on a more commercial geochem lab, which is uh, getting volume from all over the place. So if the overall volume decreases, we may have less uh, volumes. But the bulk of what we do is also linked to our on-site strategy. So this will give a good level of uh, visibility on the kind of uh, volume progression, more we have of those projects, more we'll have the revenue uh, creation. Likewise, for the trade activities, from what we see so far in terms of uh, flow and in terms of contract, we are quite comfortable that uh, we're going to be pretty okay in terms of growth. So all in all, with the soft explorations into a more commercial lab, this is a more stable portfolio in the on-site laboratories, as well as the trading uh, uh, unit, we'll see that uh, we're probably a little bit short of uh, DCS growth, but not that far off. Thank you. Um, should we go to Rory? Uh, um, while Roy is getting ready to answer questions, can I remind the people on the, the, the webcast if they would like to ask a question, they need to submit it by typing it in. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, oh, it's very close. Um, now you've done one round of um, EVA recovery meetings so far. Just interested to hear what you've learned about the 8% of your business that you said was EVA negative. Um, what have you found out? Will those businesses need more restructuring? Um, any change in future disposal plans, or when will you update us on that? Um, and then secondly, do you think that this, the shifting supply chains in Asia will further accelerate growth in the frontier markets, like Vietnam you mentioned um, this year, and whether you're thinking about redeploying capacity away from China in your own business to, to support the growth in those markets? Let's start with the question regarding EVA. So, um, we, we have this clear recovery plans, like I outlined at the investor days, and um, basically they are, we consider several closures. Um, they are, they would be they are too small or too hard to sell, so to say, right? So um, uh, we closed several of them. So the the kind of whole um, uh, uh, units which are under this EVA recovery plan, they they do in the on the last 12 months basis less revenue than they did some months ago, but the negative EV improved a lot, right? So we have um, the negative EV of this portfolio is actually, uh, since we started, is reduced by one third, um, which was so far primarily a function of either, either um, cost savings. Obviously, it happened more or less also at the same time like the structural cost optimization program. So some of these things were kind of driven by the cost optimization program and benefiting on the EVA side. Um, I also think if you, if you look to unbuilt revenue um, and, and VIP, there is definitely more attitude to to get the things built. Uh, you see this in the balance sheet; it's improving, and this was especially in the last couple of months. So I do think it has some impact also on working capital. Uh, looking at uh, your second question in terms of uh, capital deployment, 
there are actually China has been uh, uh, strong drivers for us uh, in 2019, and we expect that to carry on 2020. Interestingly, is that the domestic market is, uh, is uh, developing very fast. Uh, just some indications I mentioned is about 55% of what we do in China is already linked to the domestic market, and this is probably going to increase further. Uh, some of the international supply chain migrate to the other countries. So, I think we expect uh, to have to redeploy the capacity we have in China. We're planning to reuse that to deal with the local domestic market. And the Chinese government has committed, and we see the changes of opening up additional categories for the for the private sectors to play, while some of them are still reserved for the government entities. Uh, in terms of capital uh, for the rest of Asia, we're well, just going to, to to spend more in Vietnam, in Indonesia, uh, in places in Malaysia, where we see a lot of opportunities. Not not necessarily all in consumer goods. Uh, China is not all in consumer goods. So we see a lot of uh, opportunities. Vietnam is being one of the the large opportunities. The growth is uh, is a high double digit, and we don't see that uh, slowing down. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ed. Uh, which one? <laughs> Ed two will come after. Um, it's Ed Stanley from Morgan Stanley. Uh, on slide 15, I'm interested on your 15 million of realised cost savings. When you talk about 2,260 heads taken out of the business, how much of that 15 million is is their heads uh, versus how much is coming down from lab closures, for example? For the savings, 85% is related to headcount. For the whole for the whole program, um, you have um, you see in the walk um, 2,200 people, because obviously some people who stand who are at the company until the end and the end of last year they're still employed, so there will be additional more than 500 leaving. So the total headcount reduction will be in some roughly 2,800, and 85% of the things are personal cost related. The other 15% are other closure cost, lower rent, no depreciation. Okay, and thank you. The second question follows on from, uh, from Rory's, I guess, on um, domestic versus export China. Can you give us any figures on how fast each of those are growing? Given APAC is quite a, a large proportion of, of the overall group growth rate last year. And to what extent you may or may not be planning for disruption in China, given what's going on there? Uh, uh, we, we don't have to give uh, exact growth numbers for domestic international. The only thing I can say is that uh, considering the, the, the tariff issues, the headwinds that we have with the, the North American market, the domestic market has been going faster than the, the, the international market, and this is why you're also seeing the fact that uh, this percentage of domestic versus international is, uh, is actuating. Um, but again, not necessarily all related to consumer goods. The domestic market is also about environmental, having safety, industrial, food products. So this is also a diversification of our strategy in China, which is a good uh, addition to the two focus consumer good activities that we had in the past. Uh, if you look at uh, the current situation, I guess you're talking about the coronavirus. Um, uh, we're monitoring the situation. Uh, it's, it's too early for me to give you an impact assessment. Obviously, uh, the first week of uh, all the, the movement is happening in China was uh, in the middle of the Chinese New Year holidays. So uh, in terms of impact for that part of the week was rather minimal because we, all the operation was anyway off on vacations. Uh, certainly the latest announcement by the government to extend on the, the county uh, to extend the holidays from, uh, from the initial uh, uh, days to the 3rd of February on some of those uh, uh, provinces and the cities extending that to the 9th of February will have an impact on us in the, in the February results. So we're still monitoring. I guess we will have to wait for more news. Uh, if the situation stands as it is today, I would say the impact would be mainly on a February result because we'll have uh, one less week of activities. But as the situation develops, I will come back to you if there's further, further impact. And uh, we're looking at this uh, in a very serious way to make sure that uh, we minimize the impact. Thank you. And finally, Ed. Thanks. Uh, Ed Steele from City. Uh, two questions, please. First of all, um, what, roughly, what percentage of divisional revenue did the 
various contracts that have the bad debtors um, in 2019 comprise of 2019 revenue, please? Very small, because because we have, um, if, if you look to it, uh, the, the, the debt provision in, in some cases, like a IT, is 100% provided, right? So it's, it, in terms of revenues, they are, they, are, they are not that big, right? We talk... Uh, so it's several years' worth of revenue that you've provided for? No, 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 no. no. The outstanding, we, we have a clear quit with them, so you provide as, as you go, um, but, but um, let's say... If, if a government is not paying, you provide the full revenue which is outstanding, right? It's not it's not a massive amount, right? Okay, so, um, thank you. Uh, and um, I just want to understand a little bit more about your thinking. If, if I might, you're putting the um, the vehicle inspection contracts into GIS. Is that right? Yeah. Could you talk through your your thought process around that? Because that seems like a lot of challenges for one division. I, I, I mean, Roger is not not here, so maybe he's busy sorting some of those out. But um, <laughs> just Talk a little bit through that, please. I think he's on his way to Haiti uh, for some of the issues. Uh, now, you know what? Uh, you know, we were more focused on the on the tender, tendering process because all the process of the sales and tendering is with the government uh, structure. So this is where we were focusing on because once the delivery, uh, once the contract is accepted and the delivery is done, the delivery is typically handled by the affiliate himself. So the, the involvement of the business tr structure is to a much lesser extent. Really, at this point on, once the contract or the concession has been assigned, it's really the operational activities that kicks in, so the, the business managers do not focus on that. So the, the vision of trying to create a portfolio at the, at the government level is important. I'll give you an example. For example, a lot of what some of the activities that we do in the trade could be combined with some of the activities we do on the and uh, we see sometimes twice the same ministry for different reasons. So the idea was really to all combine all that into one single portfolio management with the different ministry uh, at the country level, and the execution will be handled by, by the country, so it's not going to be a major project. will not be going around trying to understand how each one of those stations is going to work. For sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got one more in the room, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, just uh, technically, on the um, the other non-recurring items that uh, totaled 165 million. Um, you enumerated um, the PSC gain. I mean, I'm wondering, first of all, the tax provision on the gain of 33 million is that netted or is that included in the tax expense? So the 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 gain, the gain of the PC disposal is is shown in the tax expense. Okay, so I, I'm just I'm trying to reconcile like coming from the the 259 million gain, then you had the less the 24 million impairment of uh, fixed and intangible assets, less the 10 million defined benefit. Yep. Um, then how do you how do you then get down to 165? Because I think you did all your provisioning, excluding like for your for your bad debts. That's not in these other non no, items. I mean, the, it's it's the following situation. You have the 259 to start with, then the 33 million provision for taxes is not related to PSC. These were uh, tax provisions for indirect taxes considered in the first half of this year, so they are not related to PSC. The taxes on PSC they shown in the in the income tax line. These are basically provisions which are indirect tax. Right, which are basically in the in the EBIT, um, and then you have the impairment of um, 24 million for, um, uh, for 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 fixed and intangible assets. You have around 10 million for the Swiss uh, pension obligation, and then there are other items which we not yeah, line by line disclose here who, that you come to the 165 remaining income. We can go through them in more detail yeah. later if you'd like. Yeah. Right, um, let's move out of the room and onto the webcast, please. Oh, a quick moment. Okay, well, why don't we go to the question that was on the web on the webcast instead? Very quickly, um, that is asking about 
GIS and Ghana, and given um, the payment issues we've had there, does it affect any other cash flow in Ghana specifically? Very simply, it doesn't. Okay, nice and easy. Um, are we ready to go to the, the webcast? Conference call, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. The first question coming from the conference call comes from George Gregory from Exan BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have uh, three questions, please. Um, firstly, uh, just looking at the uh, profit contribution from acquisitions, uh, specifically in the second half, it looked a bit lower than I would have expected given um, the, um, the first-time contribution of main point. Uh, was, was there anything offsetting that perhaps first-time integration cost, please? Um, secondly, in, in AFL, uh, I, I think from your comments suggests that both food and life decelerated in the second half. Um, wondering if there was anything in particular behind that. Uh, and, and finally, um, Dominic, I think you mentioned that um, uh, 70 percent, 7-0 of the, uh, the the margin decline in GIS um, can be ascribed to the um, the the the, the, uh, the collection delays, the, the provisions. Could you just clarify that? Um, um, just just check that my 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 calculation of uh, what was a, a 40 basis point headwind this year is is correct, please. Thank you. Maybe should I take the first and last one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we if we first look to um, um to to the acquisition impact, um, the main point um, is a bit below our expectation for the second half of the year. Uh, we have a let's say very good project book for 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 2020, but it's fair to say it was slightly lower in the second half of um, of last year, assuming. Obviously, the, the, our partner was still 40%, but also very busy with the deal um, instead of focusing completely on, on this business. So there's a bit of timing issue, I would say. So it's a bit lower, but in general, we are convinced it goes in the right direction and hits the numbers which we expect for 2020. So there's definitely some impact. Are there on, on top maybe some, a bit of cost of integration as well? But it's true, it's a bit below expectation. Um, if we, what, what I said regarding GRS, um, we have bad debt provisions uh, in in um, in uh, so you take the results and you basically look okay the results or the the performance of the of the business the revenue decrease how much of the earnings decline of forty percent is related to bad debt provision and what's the underlying reduction and if you look to this basically seventy percent seven zero out of the earnings decline is explained by higher bad debt provisions compared to the prior year. I hope this clarifies. Yeah, thank you. And, and maybe one, one word, obviously, you need to consider here that while we have a normal aging for this project, we have taken on top the decision to completely put allowance on the IET receivable given the fact that we have not recorded recorded any, any um, uh, let's say, uh, collection throughout last year. If I go, okay. uh, George, if I go to the question on the food and life, I would say there's nothing major there. Uh, if you look at life census, uh, we had some, uh, I would say, some short-term issues in terms of manpower uh, uh, retentions, you know, one of that affiliate because they are evolving into a, a pharmaceutical hub, so uh, sometimes we do lose uh, some of our customers to uh, some of our employees to our customer base. Um, the adapt particular cases, we have lost a little bit more than we were expecting, but uh, these are not unusual situations, and uh, we have managed to catch up the situation pretty fast, so we should expect this to be back on track uh, for 2020. And the food, I would say, is up and down. So some of the softer market, like in Germany, where I think the current market situations uh, with a bit of tighter market conditions makes that uh, our customers are, are looking at a bit tighter in terms of, uh, of volumes and, uh, and, uh, and so on. But uh, nothing major, I would say, again, the situation will come back on track. Uh, I do not see that as a major issues for, for, for the food and life activities in 2020. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I do think there is another question on the conference call, but can I check there is? No? Okay. Uh, well, also, I'd like to say that don't think by staying in at home and dialing in you get three questions. That's not part of the deal. Um, anyway, I'd like to invite you all, we would like to invite you all upstairs to a, for a cocktail. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now over. Thank you for choosing Coruscant and thank you for participating in the conference. You may now disconnect your line. Goodbye.